Hey everybody, it's Sunday, March 4th, 2014. Hope you're having a great day in this new month. Today we're going to talk about content. And so, as a business owner, say you sell handbags, stereo equipment, surfboards, uh, water bottles, whatever. Uh, you can only talk about your product so long before your mouth falls off or people just tune you out. So the challenge becomes how do you market the business that gets people's attention and gives them the right context to engage with you. And the word that makes everyone want to puke is called content marketing. And so if we look at the stages of the buying cycle, if you're not too familiar with this word, which you should be, uh, say the typical customer goes through a cycle of awareness, consideration, interest, preference and then purchase. So content marketing really falls under the top two funnel segments of awareness and consideration. And so your e-commerce store kind of gives them the USP interest preference and it has a checkout of a cart and all that stuff to get them to buy. So for example, if you look at the magazine, say Cosmopolitan or Men's Health, uh, sometimes there'll be articles that are like six ways to make your eyes look gorgeous or uh, 10 ways to wear shoes that make you look uh, like Tony Stark. And so You'll notice that on the next page, there'll be an ad for a specific product, whether it be shoes or makeup. And that's just a classic example of content marketing uh, out there in the world. They're not really pitching the product rather than adding value through some form of content before putting it in front of you. Now, the challenge for all of us as small business owners in 2014 running an e-commerce store, I think it really lies on the attention side. So if you look at kind of the world of content now. I think there's about 2 million blog posts published every day and the world's data is doubling, I think every two years. So with all this noise in the world, you know, distribution becomes a key part of whatever you create, whether that's a blog, podcast, uh, email newsletter or whatever. And maybe that's even more important than the actual content itself. And so how do you cut through uh, with the right filters and the right engagement to get to your customers? And on a bigger scale, is there still value in creating your own content when there's so much out there in the world rather than filtering it through like an app called Flipboard or you have a newsletter that just curates links? Uh, kind of there's a debate going ongoing between this. So that's what we'll talk about in today's episode with Brian Huntingman. And Brian is a writer over at a lot of publications, uh, Forbes, Business Insider, Huffington Post, Mashable, and a couple other publications that are really notable. So it'll be interesting to get his perspective on this whole content curation versus creation thing. So hope you guys enjoy it and let's get into it. Don't deliver a product, deliver an experience. You're listening to the Build My Online Store podcast, and I'm your host, Terry Lin. We're here to talk about running an online store and building a strong e-commerce brand to take your online store to the next level. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to check us out at buildmyonlinestore.com. Let's get on with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Today, I've got Brian Huntingman, a writer over at a lot of different places, but I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, Brian, who are you and what do you do? Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm a writer, a speaker, a marketing consultant. So I help uh, different companies get their messaging out there through mainly through content and distributing that content effectively. So I write for Forbes, Huffington Post, Mashable, and few other sites to uh, you know get my name out there and you know have great discussions about what's happening in the marketing space. Gotcha, gotcha. So one thing I want to kind of clarify is that when you write for like Forbes, Huffington Post, uh, like what does it look like f- from a perspective on writing for these platforms rather than say a little guy with an e-commerce store with his own blog? The difference is certainly audience. So obviously, you know, Forbes or Huffington Post has a you know a much a larger audience than would a you know uh, a company's blog. You know, they typically have uh, a variety of different focuses as well. So like they have many different verticals, everything from tech to you know life hacking to you know politics. Whereas a company blog is typically a lot more focused, more of a, a focus on reaching a very specific audience. Whereas, you know, let's say a Forbes, yes, they have different verticals that reach different audiences, but Forbes as a publication as a whole tries to reach many different audiences. Mm -hmm. So when have you seen the trend where kind of each publication has their own separate sub voice? Like when did this start kind of happening? I mean, I think from the very beginning, I think newspapers traditionally print always had these different sections to, you know, focus to different uh, interests online. When you have a, a broader audience that you can kind of segment into different sections, you can have one consistent editorial voice where it's like, okay, this is the Forbes voice. This is the voice of the New York Times. But it also, you know, falls into many different areas that uh, attract different types of readers. It's important because you want to have content that's relevant uh, to you as a reader. And the publications for the very beginning are, you know, smart because they they want to, you know, attract people with different interests. So and that kind of can be applied to a company's blog as well as that same kind of principle of you want to create content that is of interest to the people you're trying to reach. So a publication has, you know, far more people 
uh, that they're trying to reach and you know get a certain message across. Whereas a, a company, you know, they want to segment their their customer base, let's say. Um, and give them the best content that they're, they're, they're really interested in reading. Gotcha. And so what are they looking for in, like, say, a contributor that's looking to you know, help them out or have a guest post? Like, I'm sure it's really difficult because they get pitched you know, thousands of times a day. But like, what are the kind of the key things you're looking for? It really varies depending on you know, who and you know, where you're trying to write for. So uh, in a lot of cases, uh, blogs that accept guest bloggers or guest contributors, it means the same thing. Um, they'll, they'll have a kind of a section on their site that describes, hey, if you're looking to guest blog on our blog, please read this uh, you know, kind of how-to guide that we created. It'll tell you who their audience is, what type of stories they like to accept, um, you know what kind of experience level they're they're looking for, what subject areas, etc. Um, a site, and then some sites like uh, you know Business Insider and, and TechCrunch, they they have uh, forms on their site. Uh, TechCrunch has a form on their homepage that says you want to contribute a guest column, and it's a form. Um, it links to other articles that tell you kind of uh, the style, voice. Um, and kind of like experience level they're looking for. The best case scenario is to have already written for somewhere um, from other places before pitching one of the major publications or blogs just to give yourself uh, some you know, more credibility when you, you are pitching a great idea to one of these places. But you know, at the end of the day, a good story is a good story. So you have something really interesting in, in a specific niche, pitch it and hopefully it'll, it'll make it through and you can get published right away. Business Insider, they have a if you search like Business Insider, uh, how to contribute, they have a whole article that, that, that explains the process, what they're looking for. In a nutshell, all these places are looking for, for authorities on a subject that have uh, some established credibility. They want to know that you can write well. In some cases, they're really interested in you having already having an audience online. Again, just being able to see past work. And that past work could be anything from you writing personal, uh, you know, blog posts on your personal blog, uh, writing content for the company you work for, whether that's an ebook or on their blog, if you've written for another blog in your industry, if you've written for another publication, you know, th those are great, uh, you know, signals to an editor that you are you know, a qualified expert and a source for information on a certain uh, subject area, and that kind of gives you added credibility when you are pitching um, a good story to them. Yeah, gotcha. Very cool. All right, so let's move on into kind of this article you wrote, which is kind of why I got you here. Uh, so you wrote, you wrote a post called um, The Future of Content Curation, right? So I guess for people just starting out who aren't really into the content game, how would you define uh, creation and curation. Like, what, are th what do you see are the key differences there? Creation, content creation, is typically referred to as when you are the original source of the content. So you wrote a story without referencing or pulling the content from any other source. So you wrote an article based off of your, you know, your, your findings as a, a politician, your findings as a small business owner, let's say. Content curation is the act of pulling content from uh, many different sources on a specific uh, topic and presenting it to your audience with your own perspective. Perspective. So that could entail doing a roundup of the, you know, the funniest videos on YouTube today and pulling them from all of your favorite blogs that typically cover viral videos and you pull, you know, six six videos from these different blogs and put it in a in a blog post and say, you know, these are your favorite, you know, videos that went viral today and giving your own spin and perspective while also kind of sourcing where you pulled these um piece of content from yeah one thing you mentioned in the article is that it's been a dirty word like, like where is the value adding creation like i didn't see it at first but kind of as i think the internet gets noisier and noisier i think there's more value and just kind of filtering things online like i mean where do you see this trend going content curation is considered a dirty word you know quite often because um, in a lot of ways people can be very lazy with its use so for instance if you're just trying to get content out there for the sake of getting content you're trying to drive you know, you know, achieve some goal and you're trying to take the easy route. You know, you can just pull content from six different places, it doesn't really matter, and you throw it in an article and you, you know, kind of claim it as your own. And, and that's, that's kind of lazy. It doesn't really add any additional value uh, to a reader. And you're just, you know, trying to achieve the goals of getting more, you know, social media traction, attraction, and the search results without doing any of the actual work. Content curation um, becomes valuable when, you know, you really uh, make sure that it's high quality, meaning that, yes, you're taking content content from other sources and that's totally okay as long as you you know are referencing the original source and you're curating it for a particular reason you're pulling these different pieces of content from other places and giving your own unique perspective uh, you, your unique take on this content and presenting it in a new way to your audience that 
may not have seen it in its original form in all these different places. So for instance, uh, BuzzFeed uh, or the Huffington Post do a ton of content curation um, and they are quite successful at it because they you know, have a particular uh, perspective that they're that they're giving their audience when they pull content from other places. So, for instance, if BuzzFeed does an article, you know, about the cutest dogs, let's say they're pulling these different uh, gifs, images, uh, pieces of content from other sites that may not have the traction, uh, the, tra- the traffic, or the traction to get their content seen. But by taking the time and the effort to look at these places and find you know, these quality images of little puppy dogs or whatever whatever it may be, and putting them in this article of the cutest uh, you know, dogs, they pulled the, the best quality uh, content from on that subject and presented it to their audience in a new form that may not have seen it on the, on, on the original sources. So when it comes to you know, the future of curation, it's all about focusing on quality you know, for the long-term success of your content, giving credit where credit's due, um, and using the right tools to make sure that uh, the process is as easy as possible for you and, you know, you're able to maintain the quality and, you know, limit as limit the work as best you can. Yeah, so what would be, like, a poor quality example? Because I've seen a few of them, like, once in a while, I'll get tagged on these, like, paper.ly daily newspapers, and I don't, I don't really know why, but is that what you're getting at when you say low-quality creation? <laughs> yeah, I, I've definitely seen those as well. I get, like, tweeted that I, an article of mine has been added into there. Um, so I, I won't slam them as uh, a tool that focuses on bad curation practices. The tool, like, paper.li or... Uh, whatever is very useful in the sense that uh, I could, you know, every single day uh, grab these tech articles that I think are really valuable on a specific subject and really take the time to curate, you know, this kind of like newspaper online, this, you know, homepage of a newspaper online. And that'd be great, right? Well, a lot of people, you know, use that site, unfortunately, at times to just pull random content from their network, pull random content without really spending the time to focus on like a specific subject area. So it comes off as, as being lazy. It's, uh, it doesn't really add value. And that's when it, it's bad. That's when me and you are, are tagged in these random, you know, paper dialogue, you know, pages, but without any true context. It's not like they are, are trying to, you know, formulate a unique perspective on a subject. In some cases, they're just trying to put content out there for the, the sake of, of putting content. So, I think bad curation can happen on on any of these places. It's just all about the you know the the content creator themselves, and it comes down to the the resource doesn't have any actual value for the reader. Uh, it has more value for the the creator, which is the problem. Yeah, like I get these paper dot li things. Like they, I think I get the feeling they just tag me because they want me to retweet it. Like I, I get that feeling, <laughs> and it's like why would I retweet this? Exactly. Yeah, and they don't even write. They don't even write like a sentence. It's like that. You know, it's that automatic Bitly link that comes out with it. And you're just There's like, no value. Why should I? Why should I just ignore? No, I mean you're you're completely right. I think if someone wanted to do a paper dot li write, you know, they should take the time to curate it and then say, "Hey, Terry," and like write a specific tweet to you saying, "Hey, I really liked, you know, your piece on this subject, and I thought it would be really good in my, you know, paper dot li uh, that always covers this subject area. You know, care to check it out?" I think that would provide you more value, right? As opposed to this automated little tweet. Again, that's kind of like bad curation tactic. They're not actually taking the time to reach out to you. They're just, you know, automatically doing it, which is lazy and again provides you no no value because you don't even know why you're in that resource. Yeah, this reminds me of an interview I read with Ira Glass over at the This American Life. The way he does the show, uh, he'll have like random stories, but they're tied together under a theme. So for example, one was like life in the U.S. in like the 1960s or something, and then he had these tape recordings of a mother recording into the tape uh, what life's going on to her son. But if you think if you think about it, that's like a completely random. It's like random content. Right? Like, why would I care about a mom talking to her son to tape? But then when he brought this theme under of like, hey, here's what they said in newspapers back then. Here's what you know a mom and son were going through back then, and here's like what happened in the politics back then. Like suddenly it became like, oh, it was a lot more interesting too. So I guess it'd be kind of like if I was curating something today, like say uh, the best interviews of you know. April 2014, and one would be like, I think John Ivey at Apple did one recently. Like, I think Bill Gates was on Rolling Stone lately. And I think when you tie something under that, it's kind of what you're getting, right? Where there's more value add than just, hey, here's the 
top six things of April. Yeah, exactly. It's a, when it's a very specific, you know, subject that you're trying to cover or a theme, like you, you mentioned with This American Life, like that's when people can, you know, pull something from it where it's not garbled, like just, you know, unorganized information. I mean, there's so, basically curation is organizing the tons and tons of data that's out there and information and presenting it in a, in a you know, nice, clean way on a very specific subject so that a reader can take some um, value away from the piece. And so for someone starting out as like a guy with a store with a blog, do you find that curation is the way to go in the future or is, does creation still kind of have its uh, method? Because uh, certainly when you see a guy like, say, uh, Mark Andreessen or some thought leader write their own piece, it can go viral. But like as a new guy, is there still value in that or is your time better spent kind of curating? things? The answer is yes to both. I think curation is just one of many tactics that you should, you know, employ when you're creating content. So I think you should focus on uh, original content and curated content so that uh, you're varying your efforts and, you know, adding your original voice and perspective on a subject, but then also organizing um, interesting information on your industry, your expertise, and adding your input as well through curation. And uh, I think that's very helpful for, uh, you know, someone that's just starting out, you know, a small business owner or just an individual with limited time. This all takes a lot of time. So with limited time, uh, in a sense, curation helps cut out a, a lot of the legwork, um, and you just have to really focus on the quality of, of you know, uh, the content that you're creating from other sources. So I think it's just one of uh, a few different things you should be doing with your content. Mm. So realistically, would this be like, say, uh, I have my curation blog, but then I also guest post on, say, somewhere else, and then kind of you have both channels working in your favor. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, I mean, let's just say, for example, uh, in, in one week, you uh, blog one original article, uh, you create an article that's kind of curated from multiple sources with your added opinion on the, on the subject, and then on another article is uh, you writing for a third-party website you know, as a guest post. I think that's a great way to start off. That's three pieces of content, one created completely for your site by you with your perspective, one curated from multiple site, uh, sources, um, and then a third is on another site, you know, help hopefully, you know, building relationships um, and visibility to your blog. So again, exactly like uh, varying your strategy is the best approach. Mm -hmm. How would you say people should measure, like say if they go down the curation route, like because I think the content thing is like everyone knows they should be doing it, but like the time, money, and energy to invest in it, and there's a thousand other things you have to do. Like, like how would you kind of gauge your curation progress if someone had to get, go down this path? Um, your progress. Well, it's a long term effort. Uh, content is a long term effort. That's why uh, many are, are, are kind of often uh, hesitant to start doing it. But uh, you have to create, uh, even as a small business owner, uh, lots of content at scale just to stand out and get some you know traction in your industry to really measure your success it's going to be in the long term okay so like your first five blog posts um, your very first you know won't gain you know viral traction I, I highly doubt they will but they're the first step towards you know gaining an audience uh, gaining interest um, in you know the subject areas you like to talk about for your on behalf of your business letting people know you're out there and that you have a you know a blog and that you're talking you're, you're creating you know interesting stories and, and and quality valuable content that'll help them in their day I, I would measure it through traffic through you know conversations created on social media from your content but it's it's a long-term effort I think uh, this isn't something that's going to happen overnight. You really got to put, uh, you know, put in the legwork. Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts on, say, writing content yourself versus outsourcing? Because I know on the one spectrum you have kind of like the SEO keyword article, very low value to the audience, and on the other end you have like, you know, writing like a three thousand, four thousand word post that's really high quality. Like, what are your thoughts on kind of, you know, getting someone to help you versus doing it yourself? There's pros and cons. If possible, I would always create the content yourself or have an, an employee create the content for you. Um, I think your voice is the best voice since you know your company the best. You know you know your company because you work at it every single day. But then again, not everyone's a writer. So I could be a business owner. I could be, you know, have have the best clothing store in town. But I may not be a good writer, and that's okay. You can do YouTube videos or podcasts or some other content instead. But if you want to focus on written content and you aren't a good writer, you know, ha hiring a freelance writer is certainly a good tactic. You just want to make sure that. 
you know, they understand what they're doing. They're, they can show you a portfolio of other work that, and that it's quality and that they really understand your specific niche. At the end of the day, like I said, you know your business best. If you are able to give direction to a freelance writer, I think it's totally possible to lessen the workload. Maybe you do the content curation piece that's curated from multiple sources. They write the original article. You kind of give them direction on, on topics. You just got to make sure that you understand kind of what your goals are so that you can kind of inform their work on your on your content site. Yeah, and so how would you go about finding content? Because I think people starting out there, oh, I don't know what to write about. Like, where do, where do I even find ideas to get started with? So if you have the data, listen to your customers, either online or in person. If you have a, an existing customer base that you, you know, can kind of survey informally or formally, I think the best content that you can create is content that helps solve a question that your customers typically have. So if you're noticing a trend from your customers and a, and a consistent question, like, you know, how do I, you know, create an outfit that is professional store and you sell suits? How do I create a professional look for an interview per se? Let's say m- multiple customers have asked you this. You get a lot of emails about this question. Then um, a really good tactic would to obviously not only answer those questions in person via email, but also put out a blog post out there about, you know, hey, I think this is a great, you know, stick with blue colored suits and, uh, you know, these kind of pants, these trousers, because they, you know, present the best uh, you in an interview. You know, answering this common question can help, uh, you know, show your expertise on the subject. It's probably not limited to these few people, that a few customers that have asked you. It's probably for multiple customers that have the same issue. And, um, how great is it if someone is searching online, they find your store has the answer. Um, maybe they don't pur- purchase from you at that time, but the, in that moment, they associate you with, as an expert on a particular subject, which is of, of interest to the, to the reader, which is really a good thing. Okay, another route, instead of looking at your customer in, or in conjunction to look at your customer's uh, questions and interests, is kind of seeing what's happening in industry as uh, your industry as a whole and see what you can add your perspective to. Do you have an opinion on the subject? What uh, could could your company add? So when uh, Google Reader um, shut down last year, many people moved to Feedly. It's just like an RSS reader where you can look at all of your blogs in in one feed and kind of see, you know, maybe you'll, you'll subscribe to all the blogs in your industry to see what's happening, what is everyone talking about, what's a trending you know, issue and speak to it. You always want your comment, your content to be relevant to your audience. So why not talk about, you know, what's happening now in your in your industry and kind of remark on other people's opinions. You know, give your unique opinion. Uh, whatever uh, content that you know kind of seems relevant to your audience its interests um, is it'll you know what will work to you know, move the needle. Yeah. So it's about finding the right context before you even start creating the content. Yes. That's really important. All right. Well, Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Let us know where we can connect uh, and find you online. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, you can just follow me on Twitter at uh, Brian Honigman, H-O-N-I-G-M-A-N. Tweet and ask me any questions you have about content curation or anything like that. And I'm always here to jump into a good conversation. All right. Well, thanks so much, Brian. Thanks for joining us. And I'll let you know when this goes live. All right. Great. Thanks so much for having me and uh, look forward to it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Build My Online Store podcast. If you want the show notes, make sure to check out the website at buildmyonlinestore.com. And if you've got an e-commerce store, every two weeks I lead a live mastermind call with about five or six of the listeners in two separate groups where we work openly together and solve a business problem that you have. And we're all there to support each other. So if this sounds like your cup of tea, make sure to check us out at buildmyonlinestore.com slash mastermind. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch up with you guys next week.